please uh, remain standing. Good morning, everybody. I'm Father Fred Enman. I'm the uh, special assistant to the Associate Dean for Students and also the chaplain for the law school. My dear graduates, my mission this morning is to invoke God's blessing on you this day. As I look around Conti Forum, I see that you did not get to this day on your own. Your families and friends and loved ones have loved you and supported you and encouraged you. And so have the faculty, administrators, and staff here at the law school. I believe I would be remiss in my duty if I did not ask them to help me with the blessing. And I will ask them to do that in a minute. First, I would like to tell you the story behind the blessing. When I was a young Jesuit and a young lawyer, in short, when I was a young person, I moved to New Orleans, Louisiana to work in the clinical programs at Loyola University Law School. Within the first month of my arrival, I met Father Frank Coco, a Jesuit priest of the New Orleans province. Father Coco could teach Latin, he could direct retreats, and he could play jazz clarinet. On the day that I met him, he invited me to join him on an excursion to the French Quarter so that he could play clarinet with a few of the bands there. He wore his Roman collar and was a big hit with every audience. He developed a, a ministry to the jazz musicians in New Orleans, including a famous jazz clarinetist, Pete Fountain. Pete had a walking club that participated in the Mardi Gras parades every year. The name of the organization was, and I have to say this slowly so that I do not get into trouble, Pete Fountain's Half Fast Marching Club. <laughs> Father Coco was the chaplain of this club and he would offer a blessing over the members as they began their walk down St. Charles Avenue. I would like to pray that blessing over you today. And I ask all your family and friends to please extend your right hands over the graduates as we pray for them. Graduates, as you walk across this stage today, and as you walk through the rest of your lives, may the Lord walk in front of you to guide you. May the Lord walk behind you to guard you. May the Lord walk above you to bless you, and may the Lord walk within you to sustain you. We make this prayer in confidence, Lord, for you are the one who made us, you are the one who saves us, and you are the one who sanctifies us each and every day. Amen. And please remain standing for the national anthem.
Please be seated. Father Leahy, distinguished guests, particularly our commencement speaker, Deborah Wong Yang, spouses, children, family and friends of our graduates, and on this very special day, members of the Boston College Law School class of 2018, thank you for joining us at our commencement celebration. I'm pleased to welcome you, our new graduates, into the ranks of the legal profession. As I know you've heard many times today, and you will probably continue to hear it throughout the day, we are all very, very proud of you. Fifty years ago, our nation was on the verge of being torn apart by assassinations, riots, and demonstrations. The sense of progress and possibility that had dominated the years following the Second World War seemed to be coming to a halt as America was forced to confront some uncomfortable truths about race relations, the Vietnam War, women's rights, and entrenched poverty. Young people led the way by calling the American people and American institutions to account and questioning whether the nation was living, living up to its core values. Opinions differed, of course, and there was anger and recrimination on all sides. In 1968, America was not only at war abroad, but also it seemed to be at war with itself. Now, 50 years is a long time, and it's a passage that we like to, to recognize. After 50 years, we tend to be struck by how things have changed and how things have not changed. And as we reflect on what has not changed, we might ask ourselves, are we better as a community, as a democracy, for those things that have endured? Do they hold us back? Do they elevate us? Or do they elevate us and serve the common good? Well, one thing that has not changed, something I believe both elevates us and serves the common good, is the importance of law and our system of justice to our nation's ability to, to navigate through crises and difficult times. Fifty years ago, the law began to open up opportunities for men and women of all backgrounds, allowing many more talented people to ascend to positions of power and influence in American life. The expansion of opportunity for all Americans has been one of the great achievements of the last 50 years. Yet, given some recent events, one might be forgiven for thinking that those achievements are seriously threatened. We are seeing the fabric of our national unity tested once again by gun violence, racism, nativism, drug addiction, and deep political cynicism. But as members of the legal profession, we cannot be complacent, nor should we lose hope. As Robert F. Kennedy said, quote, every time we turn our heads the other way, when we see the law flouted, when we tolerate what we know to be wrong, when we close our eyes and ears to the corrupt because we are too busy or too frightened, when we fail to speak up and speak out, we strike a blow against freedom and decency and justice. Now, as we all know, Robert Kennedy was a victim of the events of 1968, cut down in his prime by an assassin's bullet on June 5th of that year. Just a few weeks ago, we were privileged to host his daughter, Carrie, here at BC Law. Carrie Kennedy is a lawyer and a human rights activist devoted to equal justice, to the promotion and protection of basic rights, and to the preservation of the rule of law. She also is a graduate of Boston College Law School. Instead of simply recalling the life her father lived at commemorations and memorials over the decades, Carrie Kennedy redefined the tragedy of his death by creating a career in law and in public service that has animated the values he lived and died for through service to others. The Reverend Dr. William Barber, the leader of a broad-based multiracial and multi-ethnic alliance of Christians, Muslims, Jews, and non-believers who are fighting for the needs of the poor and working class here in America today, reinforced that point recently at an event in Memphis 
commemorating the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, as the Bible tells us, woe unto those who love the tombs of the prophets. The duty of the living is not simply to recall the martyrs of a movement, but to continue their work. So, as you receive your diplomas today, I encourage you to reflect on where our nation has been, where it is now, and on what it will become. Remember the centrality of equal justice for all to the security and endurance of our democracy, and never fail to recognize both the power and the responsibility you wield as Boston College lawyers. Work to preserve the values that make every person in our society more fully human and allow all people to have meaningful participation and membership in the life of our great nation. I hope that in 50 years' time, you will be able to reflect back on lives and careers that strengthen the power of the rule of law and our system of justice. I hope you will have continued the work of those who have sacrificed so that we might continue to be worthy stewards of the values and traditions of the democracy we hold so dear. So let me be the first to offer you officially congratulations to the class of Boston College Law School, class of 2018. Congratulations. It's now my pleasure to introduce Father William P. Leahy, SJ, the president of Boston College Law School. Father Leahy holds a PhD in history from Stanford University, an MA in US history from St. Louis University, and a master's degree in divinity and sacred theology from the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, California. Under his leadership, Boston College has seen remarkable growth. And as he himself has written, Boston College endeavors to educate a new generation of leaders, men and women who will be capable of shaping the future with vision, justice, and charity, with a sense of calling, with a sense of concern for all the human family. Please join me in welcoming Father William P. Lee. Dean Rougeau. Ms. Yang, members of the faculty and staff, parents, spouses, and guests, and especially the 2018 graduates of the Boston College Law School. Good morning to all of you, and it's a delight to be here with you as we join in this celebration. We come here, I think, as happy and grateful people because we know what has been invested by our graduates and their families and what they have done in the way of perseverance, commitment, discipline, motivation. And that is a cause for rejoicing and gratitude. We also come here mindful of how much our world and society need individuals who are part of the legal profession that have a sense of ethics, of justice, of a desire to serve. And since the Boston College Law School was founded in 1929, BCLS has strived to graduate individuals who do have that moral compass, who desire to serve and to give of their talents. We expect our graduates not only to be competent, but also committed to the highest professional and ethical standards. That's a great career. I cannot recall a time when our country and the entire world have more needed lawyers and judges who are guided by a sense of ethics and care for the vulnerable who desire to protect legal and human rights, work for justice, and ensure the rule of law. We desperately need... <laughs> we, 
We desperately need members of the legal profession to be individuals whose lives are marked by honesty, generosity, and compassion. The law has been and remains a noble profession and a wonderful way to serve and do good, to work for the greater glory of God. Today then reminds us to look back in thanksgiving and also to prepare for the future, particularly to rededicate ourselves to using our gifts for those most in need. And so I join parents, spouses, and friends and our graduates in asking that God bless not only the graduates but also all of us so that we live lives marked by faith, hope, and love. My congratulations and best wishes particularly to the class of 2018 but to all who help them be the people they are and the lawyers they will become. Thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Fred Yin, I'm the Associate Dean of Faculty, and it's my pleasure to convey the congratulations and best wishes of my colleagues to you, the graduating class of 2018, and of course, give our best wishes to your families, friends, and loved ones. It has been our privilege to teach you for the past three years, to share your dreams, and to watch you grow. We've been inspired by your intelligence, your perseverance, and even more, your commitment to making the world a better place. Commencement is, of course, a time for reflection as well as celebration. And one of my predecessors in this position, Bob Smith, often encouraged us to reflect by recalling events from the year that each graduating class entered law school. I think he did so in part to help us think about why we become lawyers, the role that lawyers play in our society, and why it is important that we play this role. And so with that in mind, let me recall some of the news headlines from 2015, right about the time that you were collectively organized forever into members of sections one, two, and three. Now some of these are lighthearted, some of these get more serious, and I hope that will help us reflect. So in 2015, the top hit song was Mark Ronson's Uptown Funk. Star Wars The Force Awakens was released in the fall of 2015. For those of you who are followers of the National Football League and the New England Patriots, there was some guy named Tom Brady who was suspended for four games for tampering with footballs. But that suspension was put on hold in a temporary victory for Patriots fans by Judge Richard Berman, who allowed Brady to play football until the Second Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the following spring. Now, on a more serious note, in 2015, Europe struggled as large numbers of migrants left conflict in the Middle East in hope of better lives in Europe. The Supreme Court guaranteed same-sex couples the right to marry in Obersfell v. Hodges. <laughs> Jokar Tsarnaev was found guilty on all 30 charges he faced in connection with the Boston Marathon bombing and was sentenced to death. A series of shootings in the United States and abroad prompted anguished debates about the causes of individual and mass violence and the role of guns in America. In the fall, the United States, along with members of the European Union and members of the UN Security Council, finalized an agreement with Iran limiting Iran's development of nuclear weapons. And also in the fall, 195 countries created the framework known as the Paris Climate Accord to limit increases in the world's temperature caused by human activity. Now these headlines, and many others I've not mentioned, remind us of why the world needs lawyers 
and the important work that you, our newest graduates, have to do in the years ahead. Every one of these headlines involved lawyers. We don't have entertainment without the facilitations of lawyers. Questions about fundamental human rights, our collective ability to harm each other, or the continuation of a habitable planet cannot be solved with a single decision or moment of agreement. Instead, these challenges are part of a never-ending struggle that require critical thinking, a commitment to rational discourse based on truth and fact, and an openness to ideas. It's certainly the hope of me and my faculty colleagues that you have gotten these things from your education here. And so with all of this in mind, I urge you to pause and reflect from time to time on why you became a lawyer and the contribution you can make to society. Good luck to all of you, and please keep in touch. I'm now very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Deborah Wong Yang. A graduate of BC Law, Ms. Yang is a partner in Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher's Los Angeles office, where she chairs the Crisis Management Practice Group, serves on the firm's executive committee, and was the former chair of their White Collar Defense Group. Prior to joining her firm, she was the first Asian American woman to serve as U.S. Attorney, appointed by President Bush for the Central District of California in 2002. Ms. Yang represents clients in both the private and public sectors. Her clients have included Uber, DraftKings, University of Southern California, and many more. Her practice spans strategic counseling, problem solving across the white collar litigation spectrum, internal investigations, compliance related issues, and criminal investigations in multiple areas, including healthcare laws, financial controls, trade secrets, and cyber data intrusions. Let me just share a few of her awards and honors. The LA Business Journal named her one of the most influential women, uh, one of the most influential women lawyers, most influential minority lawyers, and one of the top 500 most influential people in Los Angeles. In 2017, Chambers recognized her as the top white collar defense, defense attorney in the United States. Law Dragon, 2016, named her one of the top 500 lawyers in the United States. In 2015, Global Investigations Review named her to its list of 100 high-powered women in the profession from around the world. The Daily Journal has also repeatedly named Ms. Yang to its annual list of 100 leading women lawyers in California. Ethisphere magazine, which promotes best practices in corporate ethics and compliance, recognized Deborah as one of the top guns in the attorneys who matter category, one of the highest categories possible. As an assistant U.S. attorney, Ms. Yang prosecuted one of the first computer hacking cases and subsequently launched Gibson Dunn's Information Technology and Data Privacy Practice Group. She served on President George W. Bush's Corporate Fraud Task Force, changed the, chaired the Attorney General's Advisory Committees on Intellectual Property and Civil Rights, and was a member of the Attorney General's Intellectual Property Task Force. Ms. Yang is frequently honored for her civic activities and engagement. She is a former president of the Chinese American Museum in Los Angeles, sits on the executive committee of the prestigious Committee of 100, and has been awarded the prestigious Deborah Award by the Anti-Defamation League, which honors extraordinary women of achievement. She has served as a founding member and officer of many Asian American bar organizations in Chicago and Los Angeles, and has been recognized as a champion of civil rights. Ms. Yang has been an adjunct professor at the USC School of Law and has instructed at the National Institute of Trial Advocacy and California's Judicial College. Prior to becoming U.S. Attorney, Ms. Yang was a California State Judge. In 2004, she was appointed to the President's Council for Pit Pitzer College of the Claremont Colleges and was given its inaugural Distinguished Alumni Award. After graduating from BC Law, Ms. Yang was a law clerk to the Honorable Ronald S. W. Liu in the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California. Please join me in offering a warm welcome to our 2018 commencement speaker, Deborah Wong Yang.
I'm a little short. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank and acknowledge uh, Dean Rougeau for those lovely remarks. Uh, as you can tell, I engage in a little bit of uh, career ADD. Um, and to Father Leahy and all of these distinguished individuals on the podium with me today, the Board of Trustees, the faculty and staff who are here, all of the parents, and all of the students who are about to walk on this uh, stage today. I want to congratulate all of you. Um, this is indeed a very special moment in your life. Today probably seems like a long time from your first year sitting in the lecture hall, uh, learning everything new again, hearing about archaic laws that seem to be out of touch with reality, and engaging in dialogue and discussion using the Socratic method. How nice is it to have all of that behind you? And today is a day of celebration. It's not just your accomplishments, but it's your parents, your spouses, your friends, everyone who's been there for you. As a, as a parent myself, whose children are here today, I can tell you that the amount of sacrifices that go into getting you to this place, the amount of work that they do day in and day out, showing up where they need to, just so that you can have this opportunity is really tremendous. I want to acknowledge the professors who took the time over these years to engage in legal discussions with you and to open your minds to a way of thinking, to have a dialogue, to engage in open discussion, and to conduct critical thinking and process all of that in a mature and professional manner. Their time with you was not only a gift, but it was a commitment to all of our futures. Today is a celebration of all of you. For me, it's terrific to be back in Boston and on the campus of the Mighty Eagles. It was here, and I'm now addressing older folks because I realize most of the uh, graduates today probably weren't even born yet. <laughs> but it was here that I first heard an entire city hold their breaths as Doug Flutie threw a famous Hail Mary touchdown pass to win the game against Miami. I'm still getting uh, chills as I talk about it. Literally, this girl from California heard an entire city fall silent as that ball barreled through its way in the air and made its way to the end zone. And on a personal note, I came to this campus first in 1982. I was a young, sheltered girl who'd grown up in Chinatown in Los Angeles. I'd never been to Boston before. I'd never been to New York City before. I'd never been to the East Coast before. In fact, I'd only been allowed to go to a college that was an hour away from my parents' home. And I'd never seen snowfall before. I came because a Jesuit professor that I had had told me once that he thought I would like it here. And so I ventured out. I bought my first winter coat at a place called Filene's Basement for $79. It was puffy, it was bright, and it was neon pink. And I forever became known in law school as the girl in the puffy pink parka. I first arrived here alone and stayed with a friend of a friend of a friend in what I thought was Boston, but was actually a town called Mattapan. Little did I know while sleeping on this floor uh, in this house in Mattapan that it would take two subway rides plus a shuttle bus to actually get to the BC Law campus. And how could I know that in this town, when you take the green line, that it's actually four lines? There are a lot of false starts on that before I figured my way around. But it was here at this institution and on the campus in Newton that my professional dreams began and my life journey started. And for that, I will forever be grateful. For as you come up today and walk across this stage and shake hands, what you walk away with is not just a diploma. It's actually a passport. A passport to a new stage, a new career, new job opportunities, and new ways to look at the world 
and an opening to a multitude of opportunities. The beginning parts of your career may find you in places with your heads down, learning your craft, building your skills. For some, it may not feel particularly inspiring, and it may be hard. But I remember what that federal judge I clerked for used to say to me, that the seeds planted in my 20s and 30s would reap and bloom for me in my 40s and 50s. You just have to remember to plant those seeds. My passport took me to places I never could have imagined or expected when I was sitting in your place now. It took me to be in the United States Attorney after 9-11 in Los Angeles, which is the largest U.S. Attorney's Office outside of Washington, D.C., trying to keep my district safe. I was actually the top federal law enforcement officer in the entire state of California. The U.S. government was being reorganized at that time to focus on the war against terrorism. And we were being asked to find a comprehensive and thorough way of eradicating all terrorist threats to a population in my district of 18 million residents. It was daunting, it was stressful, it was lonely, and it was completely outside of my previous skill and expertise. I was a long way from Chinatown. But my passport took me far away, too. It found me at a place where the White House at some point designated me to be the United States representative at the Asia Pacific Economic Conference in Shanghai. And keep in mind, I don't speak any Chinese. I actually speak Spanish. But I was the first non-diplomat to do so. As the, as the White House wanted to send a message of anti-corruption, engagement, and enforcement, they selected me to go as the co-chair of the conference along with the mayor of Shanghai. And there I found myself engaged in dialogue and discussions, forcefully presenting reasons why the United States believed in fighting corruption and preventing criminals from hiding assets internationally. And furthermore, why the United States believed in intellectual property laws and why we supported them. That same passport found me as a very young lawyer going to former Soviet countries right after the Berlin Wall fell. I was part of the first delegation sent by Louis Free and the FBI to interface with these emerging countries. I found myself in places like Moldova or Bulgaria training foreign law enforcement officers on how to monitor organized crime and prevent money laundering. And it's taken me to places close to home, too. I found myself being the supervising judge of the Los Angeles courthouse in the middle of Hollywood, where I would preside over a calendar filled with crimes dealing with behavior from what has been called the vice capital of America. As I used to whisper to my staff, my Chinese Catholic mother would die if she knew what I was hearing. But you will find along the way that this passport will help you find your voice and your passion. You may find the joy in representing those who don't have the same access to justice as others do. You may find joy in fighting to uphold and reinforce the civil rights for some. You may find passion in establishing laws in areas yet undefined. Keep an open mind and keep an open eye because you will find ways to make a change, real change, small or large. While I was in law school, oh, and actually, you may never know when the things you learned in law school may rear their head again. When I was in law school, I used to sit in an environmental law lecture by Zig Platt. Oh, excuse me, by Zig Platter. The Fast forward 17 years to when I was the United States Attorney, my environmental cr crimes chief came to me and told me about the fact that there were these foreign vessels that were dumping their bilge into the ports in Los Angeles. The criminal penalties for these cases were only about $1 million, hardly enough to make a dent, hardly enough to make a, di a difference, and to some of these companies, just a cost of business. When confronted with these problems, I kept asking myself, how do we make this better? 
How can we approach this differently? And for some reason, it's a professor that kept coming to my mind. I remember him talking about how to make things large, how these cases could be far-reaching, how these cases had huge ramifications for the world. And that kept playing in my head. Until finally I figured out a solution, make this bigger, make this more far-reaching, affect a larger population. And so I sat down and personally I drafted an MOU and petitioned a number of U.S. attorneys to sign that and agree to charge these dumping cases together and jointly. And by the time we charged the last one before I left the office, that penalty had risen to $60 million. I've also seen how others have used this passport and gone on to do things that they never expected. I know a former BC grad who went on to investigate and try the first crimes against genocide case in Rwanda under the UN Convention. He won that case and actually later became the US ambassador at large for war crime issues under President George W. Bush. I doubt that he imagined that he would have been doing that when he was a young district attorney trying gang cases in Los Angeles. Or my friend in Seattle who worked for years at a private law firm and then decided to look for other challenges. He ultimately found himself working for the State Department Rule of Law Project on the West Bank. He spent years there teaching Palestinians how to build cases built on actual proof and corroboration. But the one thing that these experiences have in common is that they're all premised on the reliance on a rule of law. And I promise you, I did not compare my notes with Father Leahy and Dean Rougeau earlier. I think what you're hearing here is a resonance of what we as older people are seeing in the world and want to impart to you. Because with this sense and with this passport comes some responsibility. You will hear it embedded ultimately in the oath that you will take when you become lawyers. My work has caused me to travel around the countries in, uh, and I see countries that don't have this rule of law. And in being in those places, for me, it has highlighted why we need to be appreciative and grateful for what we have. And granted, our system is not perfect and can always be better, but is vastly superior to countries where that rule of law doesn't exist. Can you imagine being detained while crossing a border that doesn't have a bill of rights? It doesn't take you very long before the fear and reality strike you. Can you imagine being in a country where an organized crime leader is arrested, charged, tried, sentenced, sentenced appealed, appealed denied, and executed in the same day? Or if you're a businessman whose property is taken by the government with no possible remedy. See, and I, as I have, many places where the rule of law is severely impaired highlights how important it is for our country and why we need to uphold those rules. But we also have much to do here, for it is a living, breathing rule. It lives because of professionals like you who will assure and support how that law is enforced. It's particularly important now, as we find our country fractured and divided, that we approach differences in an open, intellectual, and sound way, and use the rule of law as a map to guide us. That seems most important to us now, but it's actually something that we've done before, and we've been through this before. Think back to Bush versus Gore. The stakes couldn't have been higher. A presidential election and the next four years of political influence at stake. True legal questions, a country divided. Dissension in the way that Americans were interpreting what was the right thing to do and which direction to go. We found young lawyers from all over, the, all over the country who gathered to help with the factual and legal development and build that case together. These questions ultimately funneled their way to our legal system and made its way to the United States Supreme Court. And there, in a form appropriate, all of the relevant issues and arguments were set forth. Ted Olson and David Boyes. And in the end, a decision was made. No decision was ever going to make everyone happy. There was always going to be one winner and one loser. But regardless of which political party you supported, we as a country accepted those results that, we, that were decided through a legal system. 
We as a country resolved that crisis. We may not have liked it, but together we all abided in the rule of law. It is this rule of law that provides stability in our system and establishes how we govern ourselves. And we as lawyers have that responsibility in upholding it and teaching others how to follow. The words equal justice under law are engraved on the front of the United States Supreme Court building. Those words embody the ideal of the rule of law, which are at the heart and core of American democracy. And we, unlike other countries where the laws can change from one day to another, have this to rely on. Our American commitment to this rule means that every citizen is governed by laws applied through a fair and equal judicial process to resolve disputes peacefully. It is this responsibility that you carry forward and that you have on your shoulders now after you cross this stage today. And as I close out my remarks, I wanted to note one thing. I am now, unfortunately, of sufficient age that many come to me for mentorship, <laughs> for life and career guidance how to balance being a single working mother, how to move forward in a career, how to find work that is interesting and fulfilling. And there's one answer that always trickles to the top. Be in control of your destiny. Put yourself in a position where, when meaningful and interesting opportunities present themselves, you can jump at them. It will be in this way that you will always enrich your lives. I thank you today for having me here. I wish you the best of luck. Go forth, conquer, make your best life, and make the lives of others better too. Thank you. I will read the names of the graduates of the Master of Laws. Stephen Edward Brady. Tim Patrick Dublon. Leo Garnier. Jin Huang. Xiao Tian Ma. Patricia Pinto Albuquerque. <laughs> Carla Saxer Diman. <laughs> Bianca Verlangeri Giffini Brac. <laughs> Wen Li Wu. <laughs> Iman Zhang. <laughs> Shiran Zhao. Sun Yi Chu We will now be pronounced uh, be presenting the candidates uh, for the uh, class of 2018. But first, uh, beginning with the December 17 graduate, Ivana Vanya Accentivit. So for the class of uh, 
2018, uh, Nilofara Bay, Benjamin Charles Agatston, Musa Nuri Musa Al Mosawi, Nicholas Litchfield Anastasi, Magna Cum Laude. Stephen Anton Anderson, Jr. Sarah Kristen Aniszczak. Tyler Edward Archer. Brett Bachman. Nicholas James Bear. Nicholas Robert Baker, summa cum laude. Michael Joshua Ball. James Matthew Barash. Lucas Benjamin Barrett, cum laude. Sahur Mariam Basaria. Kristen M. Beal, Madeline Rose Becker, Vanessa M. Benincasa, Maria Josephine Benvenuto, cum laude, Wendy Whitcomb Balick, magna cum laude. Rithika Bakri, James M. Blasland, Chloe Sostowski Booth, Andrea Rose Brady, Kelsey Ray Bratton, Curtis James Brown, cum laude. Aaron McGowan Bruno, cum laude. Daniel James Cahill, magna cum laude. Thomas Landon Carlton, cum laude. Christopher Liam Catal Cataldo, cum laude. Nicholas Michael Centrella, Junior, cum laude. Christine Chen. Hyun Ju Cho. Jun Hyun Cho. Nicholas Ryan Crones, cum laude. Venus W. Choi, cum laude. Colleen Kira Sizek. Alana Joy Clark. Catherine Ann Clark. Peter Montgomery Cooper. Allison Holland Corcoran, Amanda Kate Creeden, cum laude, Jeffrey Donald Prislip, Kathleen Mary Cronin, Brandon T. Curtin, magnum cum laude. Samantha Cutler, magna cum laude. Aiton Martin Davis. Thomas DeBeau. Valentina Defects. 
Jacob Zygmunt Derivanda, Matthew P. Egler D. Fernando, cum laude. Catherine M. Doe. Michael Anthony Donadio. Cum laude. Ryan Thomas Storty. Dustin William Burr Dove. Thomas Edward Doyle, Jr. Yona Israel Dror. Catherine M. Drumbakis. Brian Conlon Durkin, summa cum laude. Julia Anderson Eaton. Lindsay A. Edinger. Magna cum laude. Mohammed A. El Farah. Sean Maria Estrada. Cum laude. Megan Elise Fay. Magna cum laude. Thomas B. Fiasconi, uh, magna cum laude. Tanner J. Fisk. <laughs> Alyssa Pellenberg Fixen, summa cum laude. <laughs> Timothy Patrick Ford, cum laude. <laughs> Luis Alexander. Galliani, Christopher S. Gerrels, magna cum laude, Kelsey L. Gasling, cum laude, Jillian L. Gately, cum laude, Douglas Knowles Gibson, Gibbons. Taylor Padilla Gibson, magna cum laude. Ian Philip uh, Gillespie. Colin John Glazer. Rebecca Lorraine Gobey. Bradley Taylor Goran. Vashili Goyal, cum laude. Taylor Elise Green. Samantha Gross, cum laude. Saba Hapdeg Selassie. Lorraine Leander Hadieras, magna cum laude. Paul Hart. Brooke L. Hartley, Mark Andrew Hayden, Sarah Elise Herlihy, cum laude, Marcus A. Hernandez, L Leah Rose Perskovich, Elizabeth Ann Horton, William M. Howard, Brian James Igo, Catherine Marie Ismer, Matthew Brian Janowski, Brian Alexander Judd, Jamie Beth Kamen, cum laude. Theodore A. Kaminsky, Seung Hyun Kang, 
Daniel L. Keith, Jacob H. Kennedy, Sean Bernard Kennedy, magna cum laude, Brooks J. Kenyon, Miriam Kvistani, Brian H. Kim, cum laude, Edward B. Kim, Catherine Y. Kim, Na Yon Diane Kim, Dylan Michael Knight, Jordan Alexander Knight, Jamie Kurtz, cum laude. Andrew Sella Labadini. Paul Lackis. Christina Marie Lamb, magna cum laude. Thomas Forland Lampert, cum laude. Jordan Philip Lamson, cum laude. Matthew Shane Latanzi. John A. LeBlanc, cum laude. Thomas Conroy LeBlond. Heek Young Lee. Peter Joseph Lee III. Keith Edward Levinsky. Zachary John Lieberman. Franklin Chongda Liu, cum laude. Taylor C. Lockridge. Megan Looney Pereski, cum laude. Jeffrey Stephen Lord. Jun Chi Lu. Owen Paul Lynch. David Michael Mahoney, cum laude. Justin J. Maloney. Jonathan B. Mangel, cum laude. Andrew R. Manning. Terence H. McAllister, cum laude. Nicholas Anthony McGill Bear. Molly J. McGrath, cum laude. Colin McKee. Diana B. Mayer. David Earl Miller, cum laude. Kevin J. Milton. Amandi Menas. Carl Anthony Mitsitano. Emily Kendall Mitchell. Madison May Mitchell. Rebecca Mary Winters Mitchell. Katsuya Mitsuhashi. Jennifer Irene Moore, cum laude. Michael Cody Moore. Kelly Charlotte Morgan, summa cum laude. Brittany Marie Morrison, cum laude. Matthew David Mortensen. Leslie Lloyd Mullins, Jr. Esteban Munera. Shannon Marie Nelson, magna cum laude. 
Anna Nikolaeva. Monica Nogueira, cum laude. Stephen Patrick O'Brien. Michael Robert O'Laughlin, cum laude. Chad Abraham Azbeki. Catherine Pajak. Mark Christian Palmer, cum laude. Miao Pan. Yisu Park. Robert Park. Amar J. Patel. Kenna Patel. Alejandro Paz. Alex Anthony Pena. <laughs> Mitchell J. Perney. Rodney Smith Pont du Jour. Eric David Pop, cum laude. Alexander B. Pringle, cum laude. Angelica Rankins. Matthew Scott Rupkowski. Eva Gabrielle Rasho. Nicholas Joseph Rauza, cum laude. Patrick J. Rayner. Eric Joseph Risley, Jr. Maria Agustina Robles Grimaldi. Michelle Gabrielle Rosen. Matthew William Roseman. Benjamin Javier Gustavo Ruano, cum laude. Marika Elizabeth Ruggiero. Jacob Michael Sackett. Alexander Charles Sanchez. Anna Elizabeth Sanders. Nicholas James Sanville. Janet M. Scognamilio. Gabriel M. Siegel. Seth Seidman. Haley Sensky. Mary Catherine Sexton. Leslie Paulette Schaff. Sarah Emily Shaw. Barack Jacob Schneidman. Trevor James Skelly. Demetrios Angelo Skritakis. Anna Catherine Snook, cum laude. Andrew Michael Snow. Daniel Joseph Soiger, cum laude. Wagner Nathaniel Soto. Layla Elizabeth Suhail, cum laude. Sydney D. Spillane. Lauren E. Sposa, cum laude. Aaron James Stoudinger, cum laude. Erica Lynn Steinbauer, magna cum laude. Anna E. Stewart, cum laude. 
Shivani Suhag. C. Ryan Sullivan. Alexandra J. Swanson. Matthew McCone Sweet, cum laude. Benjamin W. Taylor. Caitlin Josephine Toto, magna cum laude. Michael Francis Troy. Adana Uwazarike. Michael D. Victor. Alina Voronov. Kelly S. Waldo. Kiara Jane Fuller Walker Gibstein. Allison Elizabeth Walsh. Catherine Davis Warren, magna cum laude. Elizabeth Raquel Williams, magna cum laude. Stephen M. Wiseman, magna cum laude. Summer Wiss, cum laude. Karen Yu, cum laude. Monica Zarski. Samuel David Zuckernick. Yes, the graduates of Boston College Law School Class of 2018. We'd now like to present a few final reward, uh, awards from the class. Our first award is the Susan Grant DeMarais Award for Public Service Achievement and Leadership. Our Susan Grant DeMarais winner this year is Valentina Defex. <laughs> Tina has been an outstanding member of the law school community. She is dedicated and focused in her clinical work. She has shown unwavering commitment to fighting for immigrant rights through the Immigration Clinic and the Ninth Circuit Clinic. She cares deeply and unyieldingly about her clients. She has mounted successful cases, taken on significant workloads, and mentored new clinical students. As a member of the Ninth Circuit Appellate Program, Tina spent most of her 3L year writing drafts for the opening, reply, and supplemental briefs, as well as preparing her argument. She was the first one in and the last one out of the clinic and devoted her heart and mind to her clients. Beyond her excellent work in the clinic, Tina displayed leadership skills and helped, as she helped other students brainstorm about their cases and helped prepare other students for their oral arguments. Tina demonstrated strong leadership skills, keen intellect, and dedication to making the country a better place for immigrants. In the words of one of her classmates, quote, Tina is a force to be reckoned with. After graduation, Tina will provide immigration representation services in Portland, Oregon. Congratulations. Our next award is the St. Thomas More Award for the student who exemplifies the intellectual, spiritual, and moral qualities of St. Thomas More. This is one of our highest honors, and the St. Thomas More Award is named for a Catholic saint who famously put his devotion to faith and morality above a love of wealth and power and position. This year's St. Thomas More Award winner is K.G. Gaslin. <laughs> K. 
AG, a double eagle, indeed exemplifies St. Thomas's many virtues. He's demonstra demonstrated a real commitment to the school and its ideals. As a, 3 -L, as a 3L, not only was he an editor-in-chief of the Boston College Law Review, but he also participated in the Ninth Circuit Advocacy Program, arguing in front of the court in a way that would make anyone proud. After his oral argument, one of the judges praised his performance as simply excellent. KJ is a genuine, has a genuine curiosity and a strong intellectual commitment to the law. He searches for the right answer and is driven by precision and accuracy and an understanding of the human dimensions of the law. His faith inspires him to recognize and respond to injustice. KJ has demonstrated with every act he performs that dignity and grace are a mighty antidote to the discomfort and prejudice of others. He led by example, inspiring his classmates to accept excellence through diversity. After graduation, KG will, will join the law firm of Choate Hall and Stewart. Congratulations, KG. Our next award is the Philip Joseph Privatera Class of 95 Commencement Award for exceptional contributions through scholarship and commitment to service. The Privatera Award recognizes an individual who is an extraordinary student leader as well as an excellent scholar. Our award winner this year is Kelly Morgan. Kelly, who graduates today summa cum laude with degrees in both law and social work, has demonstrated intelligence, creativity, wholehearted commitment to each client, excellent written and oral skills, and a passion for making a change in the world. Kelly has been an outstanding student academically. She served as a member of the Boston College Law Review, a CLOW Fellow, a student practitioner in the Immigration and Advanced Immigration Clinic, and she's been active with the immigration law groups pro bono board project, bond project, excuse me. Kelly's client work has been impeccable. She has represented clients before the Immigration Court, the Citizenship and Immigration Services, the Board of Immigration Appeals, the First Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Massachusetts State Criminal Court. Moreover, she has mentored other students in fact development and case planning. She has a talent for research and writing. After graduation, Kelly will work with the immigrant communities at the Central West Justice Center a subsidiary of Community Legal Aid in Worcester. Congratulations, Kelly. The next award is the Attorney Michael A. Flanagan Award for the highest academic rank. This year's valedictorian graduating summa cum laude with a grade point average of 3.952 is Brian Durkin. Brian was the recipient of the Dean Dooley Award two years ago when he received the Dooley for earning one of the two highest GPAs after his first year of law school. Brian served as a senior editor on the Boston College Law Review, an academic success program tutor, a teaching assistant, and a student lawyer in the Community Enterprise Clinic. As a student lawyer in the clinic, he advised the startup entrepreneur about trademark rights and how to establish a limited liability corporation. He also guided a savvy board of directors of a successful North Shore profit, uh, nonprofit day shelter. The center's executive director raved about how Brian helped them to so ably all semester long. After graduation, Brian will join the law firm of Ropes and Gray in Boston. Congratulations, Brian. I'd now like to invite uh, Ritika Bakri, uh, from the president of the LSA, to give the LSA remarks. Thank you, Dean Rajo and Ms. Deborah Yang, for sharing your words of inspiration. 
Thank you to friends and family for being here with us today to celebrate, and to the class of 2018. We're finally done. It took a long three years to get to the stage. It all began with orientation, where we watched that clip from Paper Chase about how terrifying cold halls can be. That week, the most exciting thing that happened to us was reading the hairy hand case in contracts class and not getting called on. But we survived. We survived our first cold call, our first memo, our first oral argument, and our first law school exam. But we couldn't have done that without the support of each other. We hear horror stories about how law school can be extremely competitive, but somehow BC Law figured out the formula to form a tight-knit community where the only competitiveness is on the softball field. Um, in the first few days, no one really knew what to expect from law school, but we all helped each other to figure out things like what a brief means. Funnily enough, our first few case briefs were definitely not brief. <laughs> we also helped each other figure out things like which stairs lead to Stewart and which part of the building is the East Wing. But what struck me was that even deep into law school, no matter how exhausted, overwhelmed, or confused students were, they were always willing to lend a helping hand. And to me, that truly encapsulates the spirit of BC Law. In addition to our peers, the administration, the staff, and especially the faculty also played a huge role in getting us here. Their office doors were always open so we could stop by to ask questions or just to chat. And honestly, we can't really thank them enough, but I'll try. Thank you to Professor Builder for putting the prop in property. Our classes were so much more interactive and exciting because of your props. Thank you to Professor Cassidy for bringing humor to all his classes, and along with his cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Thank you to Professor Rapetti for teaching us that tax is not just a class, it's a way of life. Um, thank you to Professor Cherba for always reminding us that there's only one E in judgment. Thank you to Professor Broden and Professor Bloom for being a shining example of what a bromance looks like. Thank you to the administration and staff, especially the library and cafeteria staff for always putting a smile on our faces. Thank you to CSO for pretty much everything. <laughs> I can go on, but I only have five minutes. As many of you here know, I grew up in India. Growing up, I was always inspired by the words that were on the front of our textbook. Be the change you wish to see in the world. It's the reason I came to law school. And I'm sure I'm not alone in, in deciding to come to law school because I wanted to make a difference in the world. I know many of you share that desire. As future lawyers, we're predisposed to being future leaders. After all, many of America's great presidents were lawyers. And as we've seen in um, the last year, even if you're not a lawyer, you still need to hire lawyers. Um, as um, Margaret Mead once said, never doubt the ability of a small group of thoughtful and committed people to change the world. And I know the class of 2018 is full of thoughtful and committed people. As we've seen throughout history, lawyers have always been at the forefront of fighting for racial justice for equal rights for women and the LGBTQ community, for immigrants and for citizens who are deprived of their right to life without the due process of law. And I know that this class um, will be a shining example of those lawyers because I've worked with you, I've learned from you, and I've been inspired by you. And lastly, I would be remiss if I don't take time to thank the friends and family who've been with us through every single step. I know that I can never thank my parents for everything that they've done for me, including uprooting their whole lives and moving thousands of miles so that my siblings and I could have a better shot at fulfilling our dreams. I wouldn't be here without my family, and this is for you guys. 
Congratulations and thank you. So this concludes our commencement exercises. Once again, I'd like to congratulate the class of 2018. After the exercises are over and the, the podium platform has left, uh, the podium, uh, the, <laughs> the people on the platform have left the podium. <laughs> you get the idea. Uh, when we leave, you guys can leave. <laughs> so uh, there will be a reception uh, in the concourse uh, surrounding the forum here immediately following uh, the close of the exercises. Thank you once again to families and friends and all of the supporters of our graduates for being here. Just one more. We're officially in the afternoon. It is an honor to be here today to offer your closing words. And one of the questions I had to weigh in my mind is to be grandly eloquent or brief. Actually, 25 years ago, I was sitting out there uh, in a very uncomfortable chair, in uncomfortable clothes, with a one-year-old who was really hungry. So I decided to go with brief. Please rise in body or in spirit for our closing words. Let us take a final moment together to pray as well as to ponder the years to come. Gracious God, we ask your blessing on these graduates as they venture out into the world. Wherever life may take them into whatever corner of the law they might embark, may they be content in their days and more than occasionally home at a reasonable hour. Remind them that someday soon they might serve as the hand of justice, the voice of reason, the face of mercy, perhaps even the last hope or last chance for someone who is struggling, someone who is stumbling, someone who is in desperate need of their help. Help them to know which way to turn, what words to write or to say that might make the most good in the lives around them. And may they foster in their hearts and minds always that the law is more than an occupation, but a learned profession, a noble vocation. Grant them the patience they will need through their frustrations and the courage of their deepest convictions. Offer them the comfort they might require when the hard work and the deadlines loom. Inspire in them good humor they will so greatly need and desire when the hours are long and many tempers are frayed. May they grow into their profession as keepers of an honorable tradition, serving the people of this nation, and as advocates for those who pursue justice and seek guidance. Let them forever hold dear to their highest ideals and to, deep, and to a deep sense of what is good and right and true in the law and in society. And last but not least, remind them always that there is a lot more to life than working. There is joy to be found just around the corner with friends and family and loved ones. We give thanks for their time here at law school. And we give thanks for the blessings that we hope that they will become to a waiting world. Amen. So now we have totally concluded, and uh, we will depart, and I'm waiting for the music to start, but we'll see you all in the uh, concourse surrounding Conte Forward. Thank you once again for being with us.